Good afternoon, and welcome to St. Philip the Apostle Parish. Kindly take a moment to ensure that all cell phones and electronic devices have been silenced. Please stand. Please kneel. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that, beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless for those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins, 
Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, no spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. This will serve as my homily for this Good Friday service. I invite each of us, I invite each of us to pay attention, to listen carefully and immerse ourselves in what we are about to hear, the passion and death of Jesus. Today we stand in the shadow of the cross. Jesus suffered and died for our sins. And sadness, sadness is the dominant mood. Churches around the world are stripped of decorations with an empty altar and the tabernacle, the tabernacle door wide open as if we are all mourning. We feel betrayed by Judas. We share in Jesus' agony in the garden. We weep with Peter after his denials. We feel helpless and powerless during Jesus' trial. We are hurt with Jesus as he is nailed on the cross. And we mourn with Mary. We mourn with Mary at Jesus' burial. And yet, paradoxically, we call this day Good Friday. It is ironic that the events we commemorate are filled with suffering and sorrow, and yet we refer to this day as good. The term good and Good Friday reflects the outcome, the result, the eternal significance of the event on Calvary. Jesus had two options, either inflict on us the punishment we so deserved because of our sins, or to assume it, to take it to himself 
And Jesus chose to assume it, to take upon himself the weight of our sins. That's the goodness of this day. It lies in the ultimate act of love and sacrifice. Jesus laying down his life for us and opening the path to salvation. It is called Good Friday because on this day, Jesus redeems us, offering us, offering to us a new life by dying to our former selves and dying to our sins. It is called Good Friday because on this day, Jesus makes us good. We live in a world filled with suffering and sorrow, a world where death abounds in the midst of life. Every day we hear about death because of abortion, because of shootings, because of drug overdoses, because of suicides, because of sickness or war. We hear this every day. We hear that there is so much death around us. Yet the outcome, the result of Good Friday, the outcome of Jesus' love and sacrifice solidifies our hope, solidifies our hope that life will prevail over death, that life is good, that life is worth living. As we venerate the cross today, we embrace the complex emotions this day, this Good Friday evokes. Sorrows for our Lord's sufferings, gratitude for His abounding love, and hope, hope in the new life He offers. This Friday is called good because God is good. Please remain seated and turn in your hymnals to the lectionary reading number 1146 to follow the gospel reading. Please join in reading aloud the parts marked C for crowd. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to him, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave name, slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter 
and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintances of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around the charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, incarnating the king of death, he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But, but us it is. My kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head, and clothed him in a purple, purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So, Je so Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. 
When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was praetor preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he was handed over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. Then they took a tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, It not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them. For my vestiture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine and a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Please kneel. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, 
for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they may be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then the other, who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified to his testimony as true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage said, they will look upon him who may have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, Watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the or- from the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor in our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Let us also pray for our Bishop Kevin, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our Lord, God and Lord may open wide the ears of their innermost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins,
through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and the faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples. Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God, the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. 
Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Please join in singing hymn number 599, My Song is Love Unknown, number 599.
please stand. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Please stand. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Yeah. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Please join in singing number 982, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, number 982.
singing hymn number 598, O Sacred Head Surrounded, number 598. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve us in the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. As you know, the sacred triduum that began yesterday at the Holy Thursday liturgy is one liturgy until Easter Sunday. And so as you come, just as we do for communion, as you come to venerate the cross, to venerate the cross, come in silence. You may stay in the church after you venerate the church for prayer, or you may go quietly and it's a continuous, it's one liturgy from Holy Thursday to Sunday. And I hope that we can, that we can really keep the sacred triduum holy 
and blessed. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.